that's a reminder that this meeting is being recorded and I will uh, make it available later on. So hi and welcome, good morning or evening, depending where you are. Uh, this is the third event in the transnationally Asian series of events that are organized by, co -organized by uh, the, uh, New Bloom, New, New, New Narrative, and the Lausan Collective. So today we're gonna have a panel discussion on local and labor uh, global labor movement. Uh, my name is Kevin Lin, and I'm part of the Lausanne Collective. Uh, I'm also a labor researcher and an activist uh, with a focus and interest in, in, in China's labor movement and Asia's labor movement. And I'm deeply interested, as all the other speakers are, in building international labor solidarity, which, which you know, is obviously crucial in, in confronting global capitalism. So for this panel, we we'll have three speakers, and we'll look at three places, Malaysia, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, uh, with shared history of colonialisms, capitalisms, and advancing uh, imperialisms. So we have a little bit over an hour, uh, and in the next hour, we'll try to understand the working class struggles in all those three places, how the local resistance are interconnected with global capitalism, and also how different media organizations uh, operate and report on these labor struggles from anti-capitalist and democratic principles. So let me briefly uh, introduce the panelists. Uh, first, we had Dan uh, Sapti, uh, uh, who is affiliated with the radio station uh, Messina uh, in Indonesia. So Messina FM is a community radio established by female workers to voice equality. Uh, the radio station was established in 2009 uh, by the Cross Factory Labor Federation, uh, whose membership are mostly female workers in uh, garment factories uh, in East Jakarta. Uh, and it has, you know, it's a region that has been one of the biggest producers in the global fast fashion industry. And she will talk quite a bit about uh, the struggles, but also um, the, the radio station and the media practices that, that report on, on those struggles. And next up, we have uh, Yang Kang, uh, who is based in Taiwan and affiliated with the New Bloom uh, publication. Um, uh, Yang Kang is an NGO worker at a Taiwanese, Taiwanese human rights organization. His lifetime venture is to build solidarity across East Asia and its collective memory of war, capitalist development, and attempts against patriarchy. And last but not least, Promise Lee, uh, based in the US and affiliated with the Lausanne Collective, is an activist and writer from Hong Kong and Los Angeles. He aims to build solidarity between trade unionists from Hong Kong and the US. Uh, he's active in several US-based socialist organizations, uh, including Solidarity and the Democratic Socialist of America, DSA. Uh, he's also a former Chinatown tenant organizers, organizer. So each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes, uh, after which we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So if you have questions for the speakers that are, that are either directly related to their uh, presentation or just broadly you want to understand uh, labor struggles and media practices in, in Malaysia, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, please don't hesitate to uh, type your questions in the chat box. Uh, uh, and of course, you're also very welcome to introduce yourself in the chat box as a few folks have done. So without further ado, we will go to uh, Dian first. Uh, Promise, can you share the screen? Yeah. And Dian, take, please take it away. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the room uh, to speak. Um, today I will present about the uh, community radio or media Media, community media that uh, we built, Marcina FM. Uh, Marcina FM uh, was built in 2012 by ABLP or Across Factory Labor Federation uh, that concern on women workers' rights and also feminism um, and workers' rights, of, of course. On the radio, um, we named Marcina. Uh, Marcina is a women worker who died or raped and murdered by uh, in Suharto regime uh, in 1993 because uh, she spoke for her rights, uh, including minimum wage, uh, maternity rights, freedom of association, and her case until now is still a mystery. 
Mar- Marsina FM uh, built uh, from women workers for welfare and equality. So um, the, the logo uh, is the reflection of our mind and our, our anger, expression, love, and our dream that should be spoken. So the radio is run uh, and managed by women workers for women workers. Uh, Marcina FM is built near uh, with the near with the industrial park. It's most, mostly our garment industrial garment uh, industry. A name KB, KBN Cakung. Uh, it's in North Jakarta. Yeah, and KBN Cakung is now about 34 years. Uh, the owner is a local government of Jakarta. Uh, mostly garment industry and now there are 12 companies and 90 percent are women workers so uh, before uh, in in this industrial park about um, more or less about a uh, hundred uh, companies uh, garment uh, but then uh, relocate to central java uh, because in central java uh, the workers are cheaper and also the land uh, for the companies to uh, to build manufactures uh, is very is cheaper, so they move to Central Java. And what about the working condition? Uh, mostly are contract workers under minimum wage, uh, no overtime payment and union vesting and also the dismiss uh, the dismiss often happen uh, actually also when the owner move to another uh, area or another province uh, they neglect uh, the workers so they do not they did not pay uh, the compensation for workers that left behind and also the violation of maternity leave, maternity leave and long hours working. And now uh, we also join the demonstration or rally against omnibus law, the job creation omnibus law. So uh, we conclude that uh, omnibus law is a patriarchal, patriarchal bill. Uh, because uh, female laborers or women workers will be the group with, with no power and will be vulnerable to being suppressed and dismissed. Um, the job creation law uh, formulated uh, to suppress and dismiss uh, women workers and the omnibus law do not off, uh, the omnibus law uh, overlooks reproductive work encumbered over women so, uh, they they do not uh, the omnibus law do not see in gender perspective uh, in which uh, they formulate of the they formulate or regulate a wage system based on time and achievement clearly hinting at an hourly based wage system which is concerned to significantly affect the wage of female workers in the situations of uh, pregnant and also uh, menstruation and miscarriage uh, that in this situation women uh, need to have a rest in a working in a working hours uh, for example when the women workers are pregnant uh, in first month until third month uh, they need to uh, they will feel uh, not good uh, their body their body changing uh, and also uh, they feel not good so that uh, sometimes they have to go to toilet or also uh, the clinic uh, in the uh, manufacturer. Uh, so when the wage system is based on the time and achievement, uh, they will lose the the wages. So the take home pay uh, wages will be uh, potentially uh, under minimum wage. So that's why we refuse uh, omnibus law. And also this uh, job creation omnibus law uh, do not uh, give more protection of the maternity leave, uh, maternity leave, and also uh, menstruation, menstrual, menstrual leave. 
uh, for example, uh, in our uh, labor bill, um, many violation against uh, maternity leave. For example, when the women workers are in a contract uh, system, they work in contract system, um, and they have a pregnant, uh, they will be very afraid to tell the come the boss or the company that they have they have pregnant. They are pregnant. Um, they are afraid that the boss will cut uh, the contract and they will lose the job. So um, they pretend that they do not uh, pregnant. And sometimes they they have to uh, hide their pregnancy. So it's very bad uh, because they will lose uh, the their rights on menstrual leave. Also, when the women uh, not married but uh, have pregnant, uh, the they cannot access uh, maternity leave because uh, the company uh, very often they they have regulation that uh, the women should uh, give uh, proof uh, the marriage uh, marriage certificate marriage uh, letter uh, that as a, the proof that they are married. So uh, the pregnancy. That if they have, they are pregnant but not married, they will not get maternity leave. Uh, we conclude that the government should uh, protect uh, this kind of uh, this kind to protect the women workers uh, in maternity leave um, to stop the violation by the uh, company by uh, have uh, regulate the the law that more strict so that no violation anymore by the companies that. Uh, the job creation uh, bill uh, do not say anything about it. Yeah, this is the brand. Okay, you see uh, the brand that produced by uh, women workers, uh, mostly in Indonesia. Uh, they produce uh, Gap, uh, Walmart, Kohl's, Express, Nike, Adidas, and in this pandemic situation. Uh, Nike, for example, um, the manufacturers only give 50% of the minimum wage, so it cuts 50% uh, in the name of pandemic. And they said that the company said that Nike cancel the order so that they should uh, cut the wages. Uh, we do not yet contact Nike, maybe uh, soon we will contact Nike because the brand should have a uh, responsible for the situation of the government workers. And also a lot in, in global supply chain, uh, many uh, government workers uh, work not in a manufacturer, but also but in, uh, at home. So uh, many companies that uh, give the order, order give the, uh, the job to, to workers, to women at home, so that the women uh, produce produce a lot of brands um, in uh, at their home. So, but um, the system and the law do not admit the workers uh, at home as workers. So they do not have any protection. Most workers also live in a. That's why most workers live in poverty, trapped in debt and also become the victim of domestic violence. Uh, in the pandemic situation, uh, we have a, we advo have an advocacy on domestic violence because uh, some because many women workers also dismiss in the name of pandemic and they should stay at home. Uh, their husband uh, harass her and also uh, some are raped rape in a domestic and seriously in Indonesia uh, we do not yet have a, a protection we do not have a sexual violence uh, bill uh, that protect women uh, from the sexual violence including uh, rape in domestic we have a domestic violence uh, bill but uh, the specific uh, specific bill to fight against uh, sexual violence uh, not yet uh, exist in Indonesia. Um, this year, uh, 2020, it canceled by in the, by in the, 
Indonesian uh, representative, um, House of Representative, but uh, the representative uh, legalized omnibus law. Omnibus law uh, uh, combined uh, arrange uh, 83 uh, bill as one in job creation law, and it only take uh, one year less than one year uh, so can you imagine uh, how the law that uh, that regulate of uh, many people's uh, life only legalize less than one year so uh, we conclude that uh, it's not it's not uh, good for the people and it's not it's unfair for the people and it will be very uh, harder uh, for women workers who work not only uh, in the manufacturers or in workplace, but also at home. And uh, the system, um, the economic system, takes advantage of the reproductive reproduction reproduction work at home, but never admit it. That's why the bill of uh, um, the bill of uh, from the domestic work, uh, not yet legalized. It's about 16 years from now. So we can uh, conclude that the Indonesian governments uh, do not have any women perspective. So this is what uh, we have, uh, Marcina FM. We have a video. We already produce uh, Angka Jadi Suara or The Days the Voices Will Rise. It's a movie, a documentary movie about sexual harassment in working place. And also we have a blog website that encourages women workers to write their stories and publish in Masina FM. And also radio, the broadcasting and talk show, live streaming in media and social media. And also, uh, we have a pages, uh, FB and IG, Instagram, uh, campaign, the working condition of women workers. Uh, we produce poster, illustration, picture, and we publish in social media. Um, so, the challenge. Uh, we learned that uh, community media is a media for the community to speak up uh, their rights uh, directly. So that uh, it's the place uh, for women workers to speak up, to have a self-participation uh, on their own media or medium. Um, we should improve uh, the skill of women workers in producing content, uh, stories uh, in the many platform, uh, audiovisual articles, audio, uh, in the middle of the pro their problem as women and workers. Uh, for example, when we produce Angka Jadi Suara or the days the voices the days the voices rise, uh, they become uh, the camera person and they do the they do uh, the film documentary uh, in the middle of the work as workers. So it's very hard, but uh, at the same time, uh, it can improve uh, their confidence. And also, they believe that also oh, uh, we can do it. Um, in the middle of many problems, uh, they endured as women workers. And also, uh, the second challenge is how to increase women workers' participation in community activities as the strength of the strength of the community media. Um, we believe uh, that uh, we should uh, provide a safe space uh, and comfortable space for women workers uh, to improve uh, their skill, to improve themselves, empower uh, themselves as, uh, as the women workers, uh, as the strength, the strength of the media. Um, sometimes uh, we should um yeah we should accompany them uh, to face their problem and also uh, empower encourage them that they can face uh, the problem 
and um, as uh, mentally, physically, and how to have a, a courage uh, to speak up uh, their mind. And the third challenge is about fundraising to cover the cost of community media. Uh, so far, uh, membership fee of the union and also crowdfunding uh, is the source of our uh, our fund, um, the fundraising. So uh, we still struggle uh, for this. Uh, because uh, community media are not allowed to have a uh, commercials, uh, so that uh, we should uh, try to uh, to access their so therefore uh, the community with the local content and also specific content uh, can uh, speak up uh, and can rise uh, in the in the middle of uh, uh, mainstream media that do not give any space for local content uh, to be exist uh, in the media. So uh, we think that uh, we should uh, hand in hand together uh, with another community media so, so we can uh, Defends uh, our rights as the uh, community media because uh, now we have a bill of IP uh, that um, it's undemocratic and can be very uh, repressive uh, for us if um, we criticize the the regime or we criticize the employer about. Uh, their violation against women workers' rights or workers' rights in general. For example, uh, now when we have a demonstration, um, the government declared that uh, they can ban uh, the account of uh, social media who are who criticize the regime and they try to arrange uh, who uh, the content that is allowed allowed to be posting or not. So I think in a digital era, um, we should uh, prepare for this kind of uh, issue. And especially in the time of pandemic that everything uh, become online and we really need uh, the space in an online uh, platform so that we can uh, contact uh, each other and build uh, solidarity uh, in international level or uh, national level. Thank you very much. Uh, that is my presentation. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dean. Uh, thank you for for sharing uh, you know the stories and the struggle of women workers in Indonesia, but also just an amazing uh, community uh, radio project that you're you're working on, and we're definitely interested in. Uh, hearing a bit more and exploring more uh, about how you're able to uh, do so much um, um, in Indonesia. So thank you so much. Uh, next, we have Yang Kang, who is affiliated with the with New Bloom Project. Uh, Yang Kang will uh, be speaking about the labor movement in Taiwan. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, I'm Yang Kang. And um, I just woke up, so I look kind of bad, and um, I get really nervous when I speak in front of a group of people. So I'm just going to pretend I'm talking to a screen. And um, I'm the member of New Bloom, and today I would like to talk about the Taiwan's labor movement in recent years and the reaction from the progressive administration, mind the air quotes, and the overview of the labor movement's history in Taiwan, mostly the union history in Taiwan, and its very awkward geopolitical implications and why it's so hard to do labor movement in Taiwan. So um, since I only have 10 minutes, I'll try to try my best to keep myself concise, but um, for other speakers, please, please do feel free to interrupt, to interrupt me if you would like to ask something, some question, or to clarify anything at all. And um, I think most important of all, I have to say, um, since that I'm, I work in a human rights NGO, I um, never, really raise the hammer in my hand. I'm not really a worker. I'm not a organizer. I'm just a observer. So um, this is only my best attempt to try to represent the, the actuality 
um, this, not, this is not from a experience of a worker per se. Okay, so um, let's begin. So right now, um, sorry, I don't have any slides or anything, so you have to look at, look at my face that just woke up. Um, uh, so the thing is, you don't really see Taiwan being listed on the card um, of people's pinned tweets, right? Right now on Twitter, people have a pinned tweet, and inside there's a card information, and there's a lot of countries inside Lebanon, Hong Kong, um, Azerbaijan, anything, but you don't see Taiwan. This means that um, Taiwan somehow actually um, maintained a relatively um, stable place in the uh, in this world in 2020 right now. Okay, so um, Taiwan under the DPP administration had entered a, a condition I would like to call a technocratic stability. Okay, so from the COVID response to their management of everything, um, Taiwan don't really Taiwanese people don't really feel anything. I think one of one of the most underlying uh, condition that Taiwan is so hard to do labor movement is that Taiwanese people don't really feel like we live in capitalism, right? In the U.S., you have a very awful healthcare system. You have a um, draconian college education system. You feel you feel everything under the system, but in Taiwan, um, somehow the skill of the government is pretty good so that you were oppressed, but you don't feel like it. I think that's the most awful thing that can happen in, to a population of people. Okay, so um, the DPP government have a, the, the skill of governing, but not the capacity. That means that they can make you feel like you were being taken care of, but when they really want to do something, they often fail to do that. And this comes to labor inspections, and also they try to um, outsource some of that um, oppression and suffering to people other than the Taiwanese people. That means the migrant workers. So um, yeah, this is the basic um, underlying conditions of um, labor movement in Taiwan and labor conditions in Taiwan. And also DPP is a, um, a newly formed, in, it was formed in 86, I believe. And they're very flexible. Um, their flexibility is the reason why they can beat KMT and um, promote democracy in Taiwan. But also their flexibility made it really hard to form new grassroots movements. And I'll talk about this later. They are very happy to include progressive youth into their party and to keep them happy in, inside the party, make them feel they're making some contribution, but actually not improving the actuality, the condition whatsoever. Okay, so far so good. I'm, I'm really nervous. I, I just noted lot, like we maybe have like 50 people right here. That's awful. Okay, cool. So um, if you, <laughs> thank you. If you see Taiwan, you can see that our labor, our movement, our social movement were, was not based on labor, right? If you see people on the street, they're not being mobilized by their unions, by their colleagues. They're not. It's more like a, um, it's more organic. It's good in some way. But also this signifies that our union are not really that um, capable in mobilizing people onto the streets. And I'm going to talk about the reason why. So um for some of you might not know that taiwan underwent a 38 year long martial law and um, all the way till 80s late 80s and the labor movement of taiwan actually started alongside with the democratization and after that it rapidly underwent a lot of transitioning under multiple shifts and this made things really hard so um from 89 to 92 is the era that maybe we most um, uh, recognize as a labor movement, that they organized in some unions, some strikes, and they clashed with the government. And there's one man that usually to, uh, he used to organize w w women's worker in garment factories uh, and was sentenced to one year and more just for organizing in prison. Okay, so this is the era that I think we can most recognize as a labor movement. But um, in 92, because the first general election of parliament was happening, 
yeah, the first actual democratic election of government happened in 92. This shift, the union and labor organizer, organizers focus onto elections and struggles within the establishment. So KMT being a um, nationalist right-wing party, they, they had been hostile to unions for decades, for a hundred years or more. But for DPP, a newly formed flexible party, the unions and the labor organizers think they can try to depend on DPP. And that's true at the time in some ways. Okay, so um, they try to be closer to the um, politicians and they tend to shift away from actual union organizing. And in the late 80s, something happened in Taiwan that our rapid economic growth slowed down, okay? So um, when they're having all these attempts and having all these um, structural reforms to their unions, they are losing their base of their leverage. Because if you have a large union, you have a, large, a, a lot of people working in manufacture, then well, you can organize a lot of people and to do something that will actually have some leverage against the government. But when you don't, you don't. So um, let's talk about the union structure for a bit. Um, in the martial law era, like I said, the KMT is a right-wing nationalist party, but in 29, when they're still back in mainland China, they're trying to um, making the unions not so easy to be pulled away by the Communist Party, right? Because um, that's the main goal and main concern of them right there. So they developed this state corporatism to, in Taiwan as well in the martial law era, so that any industrial and vocational unions in Taiwan have to join the general union, it's called Zonggonghui, and their prefectural chapters. Okay, so um, unions in this system basically don't really have any function. They just call it unions, but mostly they're not functioning at all. They're not there for the workers, they're not there they're, they're not even there for the employers. Their, their main focus right there is to make sure nothing bad, nothing um, leftist happening in those factories. And that's the only concern the, the KMT have. Okay, but in the early 90s, the union discovered that due to some legal ambiguity, they can also organize prefectural industrial unions on their own, so they did, uh, but all of this, all of these struggles is in the midst of a economic slowdown. So from all this shifting to politicians and the structural reform and all these things was based on the um, background of our economics was slowing down. So the unions in Taiwan basically just um, disappeared after that. There, there, are some factual, there are some factions fighting each other, there's some infighting. This is just not whole mess. And also, there is another thing that is, um, I, I, I don't think it's really special to Taiwan, but it happened in Taiwan, that the unions of Taiwan was organized based on the sentimentality of brotherhood between workers, but not a class consciousness, right? I go out with you because I know you, but when this factory goes out, I don't go out with them because we're all proletarian. It doesn't work like that. It's mo mostly like a kin kinship-based system. This also means that, oh, 10 minutes. Sorry, I'm, I might have to go on a little bit longer than 10 minutes. Um, so the labor movement in Taiwan, it's really hard to combine with other movements. For example, if you work in a govern, gar garment factory, it's really clear to see that they care about gender equality more because they have more women workers. But in the 80s, if you work in a factory or a site that is mostly male, they don't give a shit about gender equality at all because that's not their problem. That, that's not problem inside their kinship, right? So that's also one thing that made the labor union and labor organizing kind of weak in some way. Okay, so um, this is being said by He Ming Shou, a really famous scholar of social movement in Taiwan in 2008 that Labor movement in Taiwan is based on brotherhood rather than class consciousness. And this is bad. It's really bad. Uh, <laughs> okay. And um, another thing is that um, 
we fast forward to recent years, this haven't changed for a long time. And in recent years, there's some being some changes, but those changes and this um, new hope seems kind of weird. Um, also, my background is from Star Wars, if you can see that, A New Hope. Anyways, <laughs> labor movement after Sunflower is also very um, depressing because in 2018, you can see there is a massive um, Sunflower-like uh, organizing against the amendment of the Labor Standards Act. But you don't see the outcome as successful as that, okay? Um, first of all, the reaction of the progressive administration at the time is pretty harsh. They, they cracked down the protests. And um, also, some main leaders of that um, movement was also leaders of Sunflower. And after that and during that, they were being cooperated by the DPP once again. So they were given some position in some places. I'm, I'm not saying they're being bought. I'm, I'm saying that it's really hard to organize something in Taiwan that will not attract the friendliness of the DPP. They will say, well, if you want to do something, then join the system. And this seems like a very intuitive thing to do, right? And uh, some of the more successful strikes in Taiwan after the sunflower was being done, being initiated by flight attendants and pilots. Um, what does this mean? Flight attendants and pilots are not the proletariat you have in mind, right? You have in mind like the, the muscle, muscular people holding a hammer and sickle and just go on the street waving red flag. But flight attendants and pilots seem like kind of bougie in some way. So um, this also made Taiwanese people really hard to conceive their strike as a strike. And I think this, this is really harmful. To, to the strikes and unions and labor organizing in Taiwan. Um, and lastly, I would like to point out two things because I passed my time. But um, I think um, I, I would like to say the historical context of labor movement in Taiwan. In Taiwan, there's one thing I don't think it's, um, it's as salient as in other nations, I mean, including Hong Kong. That is the um, underlying issue of China, right? In Taiwan, almost every issue can be linked to China one way or another, including LGBT, right? Um, so labor, of course, we, if we have a strong labor movement, we will have a weak industry, um, the employers will flee to China. That means national security crisis um, if we have strikes. That means that our police have to go on the streets. That means they are not, um, they are not being so able to detect attacks from China. It's a national security crisis. It's always being back down to that factor. And it's really not healthy. But that's the underlying condition here in Taiwan to organize anything, especially look kind of lefty, looks kind of red in some way. That's really um, not being welcomed by Taiwanese general public and conventional wisdom. And the next thing is that um, because we don't really have a, a national labor movement per se, so I think um, to start a transnational solidarity on the basis of labor movement is not that easy. But I think maybe the first step is to look at Taiwan's position in global capitalism. That includes um, Taiwan's capital outside of Taiwan doing harm to other people, including in China, um, Foxconn. A lot of people just jump off buildings in Foxconn. I don't think that's a natural phenomenon at all. And in Vietnam, um, Formosa Steels have this um, factory in Vietnam that just polluted the fuck out of that region. <laughs> it's it's um, catastrophic. And um, the second part is migrant workers. Actually, migrant workers is, um, Migrant workers is one of the group that housed one of the most robust labor movement. They have the experience maybe they acquire in their home, home country, but in Taiwan, they are very successful in gaining some support. And um, I think maybe to form solidarity with those people that we exported and outsourced our most dirty and uh, what's the 3K jobs? Kitanai, uh, yeah, whatever, 
those um, unwanted jobs to those people, maybe by forming our solidarity with them is the first step to build maybe some real solidarity among proletariat and working class. So that's all. I think um, I probably said all the things that I can say. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank, thank you so much, Yang Kang. I think that was very clear and really excellent overview and analysis of, of both the, uh, the labor movement history in Taiwan, but also recent struggles. And, and thank you also, especially for emphasizing the, the importance of transnational solidarity. Um, yeah, and I think we're, we're gonna explore that a bit more as well uh, in Q&A. So next up, we have uh, Promise Lee. Promise is uh, affiliated with the uh, Lausanne Collective and, and he'll be talking about the uh, union movement in Hong Kong and the role of uh, Lausanne and other media outlets in supporting, uh, reporting and supporting the struggles. Promise. Yeah, thanks, Kevin, and the uh, other presenters. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give a similar caveat as Yang. Um, I want to acknowledge my position of privilege, right, not as a worker in the movement I speak of, but as a student activist in the diaspora, and I'll do my best to kind of center the voices and activities of the union movement I'll talk about. So in the last year, Hong Kong has not only seen the largest mass movement in its history, but also the largest rank and file wave of unionization yet. While the city's history is filled with political strikes and labor uprisings from the rickshaw drivers in the colonial period to the dock workers, steel workers, and cleaning workers since the handover, this marks perhaps one of the first times that workers across that many sectors self-mobilized to unionize as a strategy to build an ongoing mass movement. This includes professions from speech therapists to dental equipment producers to fast food delivery workers and stage dancers. Though the protest movement on the street streets has significantly subsided with Beijing's introduction of the national security laws. Workers and other organizers are continuing to develop these new unions, just as managements across the city are preparing to go on the offense against some of them, especially teachers and hospital workers just in the past week. Today, my talk is about foregrounding the following questions. What is the significance of these unions in relation to the mass movement? And how can this unexpected labor upsurge help us contextualize the new dynamics between labor and mass politics in today's world. One thing to note is that organized trade unions have not been strong in post handover Hong Kong. The development of the latest workers upsurge supports this. Anonymous workers met online in apps like Telegram and looked to unionization as a strategy to pressure the establishment from a new front. And traditional union structures like Hong Kong Confederation of Trade Union, the kind of biggest uh, labor uh, coalition of the opposition camp, had to catch up to provide support and frameworks for this energy. Though HACTU's political education and resources were pivotal in sustaining and developing these unions since their inception, this phenomenon testifies to the independent capacity of the working class to organize with the right energy and circumstances, even in a political milieu in which labor has historically been weak. The initial group chat that kickstarted uh, the union movement is still active on Telegram, with tens of thousands of members, regular updates about new union progress and is managed in a decentralized fashion. It is important to note that many of the new unions are still not directly managed by HKCTU, but merely supported. The task for allies and activists is to take worker self-activity seriously without uncritically valorizing these still inchoate formations and forgetting the need for political exchange and cultivation through struggle and solidarity. That is, as a friend and comrade of mine puts it, not to make a fetish of organization or spontaneity on the other hand. It may be relevant to think about labor theorist Kim Moody's conception of the rank and file strategy here, which bridges the gap that exists, especially in Hong Kong, between the left and the organized working class by centering militant rank and file workers to push for greater union democracy and class consciousness across the mass movement. This perspective is not to disparage the role of union staffers in the Hong Kong Confederation trade union infrastructure. Instead, the key for the left is to center the organizing power of everyday workers from even joining them at their ranks by working in these industries to gathering local and international supports and allies on a grassroots level, not just exchanges between union leadership and staffers. In the generation of leaderless movements and the failure of traditional left structures to gain ground across Asian resistance movements, this upsurge of worker struggle promises to give ideological character to social movements without subsuming them into dogmatic conceptions of what left movement building should entail. In fact, the absence of socialist and left-wing parties and organizations in this movement's leadership 
does not necessarily signal the narrowing of possibilities for the left. While capital's exploitation remains only all the more trenchant, the left needs new frameworks to understand how anti-capitalist organizing can organically manifest in a new praxis of movement building opened up by mass struggle. In this scenario, what, what is the role of a collective and media outlet like Laosan in the context of these labor struggles? Our members are scattered across the world, many of whom, though not all, are in the diaspora. The key is not substituting worker self-activity. It's cultivating, gathering, and organizing workers and activists who are embedded in these local struggles to exchange strategies and ideas. The main questions one must answer are one, what kind of organizing activities and structures can best sustain these engagements? And two, what political principles should guide our practice of labor, labor movement solidarity? I try to answer these questions in practice with other members in Laosan and our organizing work. For example, in the past summer, we organized an online webinar exchange for unionized medical workers from Hong Kong's new Hospital Workers Union, Hospital Authority Employees Alliance, HAEA, to the US's SCIU and National Nurses United rank and file workers. One of our key organizers, Gaston, who was also the moderator, brought on the American panelists whom he met in other movement spaces in the past. This connection can hopefully serve as the ground for future solidarity, perhaps even soon, as many HAEA members are actually facing a threat of retaliation for striking earlier this year. Our intention was to do similar engagements for different sectors, from design and arts workers, to our connecting some of the rank and file museum workers organizing in the US from San Francisco to New York, to the new arts unions in Hong Kong, who are thinking about workplace issues, especially in light of job precarity in this pandemic and to sanitation workers, right? Um, I think some of the staffers I know from HJCTU mentioned that this is the 30th anniversary of justice of janitors in the US and wanting to kind of bring more of that kind of political education to Hong Kong janitors and sanitation workers. The idea is to build trust and relationship between rank, rank and file workers and activists directly involved in local fights across important sectors to build toward an international labor solidarity network, right? For Hong Kong and Chinese unions in the long run that can hopefully be sustained. This is also supported, right, largely by our translation work and translating materials by these unions to an English-speaking audience. Laosan's transnational positionality, in particular combination of being both a media outlet and organizing body, can begin to cultivate these connections to hopefully build the overall capacity of the international labor movement in whatever space we can. Whether these organizing projects, right, from the long-term sustenance of these new unions to Laosan's trans transnational solidarity work will be successful, remain to be seen. But what is certain is that in today's globalized economy, labor struggles must be interconnected across locales. And more specifically, we need new frameworks and resources to reimagine what labor militancy and solidarity can look like. Hong Kong CTU staffer Leo Tang recently wrote a letter to the unions from prison, explaining how the union's identities, or specifically CT, CTU's identity, has long been submerged under the pan-democratic opposition banner unable to work out its own political demands clearly in the social movement. I think this is a critical point for labor movements to think about. How has labor often been reserved to its own corner of political activism? How can labor be centered in the recent upsurges of global mass movements? I don't necessarily mean how we can maneuver traditional labor organizations into the organizational center or vanguard of movements, but rather how can workers' power be permeated and expressed in and through the general composition and political direction of these movements themselves? Capitalist exploitation, its gendered and racialized forms, continue to determine people's oppressions in Hong Kong. Even the mainstream demands are only instantiated in class-blind, abstractive forms in terms of human rights and free speech. Hong Kong's lesson should be humbling for the left, that the most promising worker-centered elements come not from the usual militant's prompting, nor does it take the most predictable forms, but comes from people's self-organized capacity to look to the workplace as a site of struggle, though there remains much to cultivate and develop. As labor activists, we must continue to build the political power of rank and file workers against entrenched union bureaucracy and state capitalist repression. As a labor act activist and militant from Detroit, Martin Glaberman once said, workers have to deal with their own reality and that, that experience transforms them. As, this, as the transnational left, our role is to stay tethered to these struggles, to witness and work through the contradictions with and as a working class, the only position from which radical systemic change is possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Promise. So that, that was a really, really great uh, look into 
uh, both the, the exciting unionizing effort, but also you know the, some of the challenges that you highlighted uh, politically. Um, so thank you for also for to all the questions that we have been getting. So I'm going to try to group them into uh, a number of things. So I, I will start with uh, let's start with the the question of uh, migrant labor and gender. I think that in in different ways that uh, all the three speakers have have touched upon. So maybe let's start with Dan. Um, I, I I assume that you know the migrant worker, uh, the female worker that you're speaking of, they are I guess domestic. Uh, you know, they're internal migrant workers. Uh, uh, so how how is this? Hey Dan, can you hear us? Hey Dan, can you hear us? Uh, can you do this? Thank yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's some sure, not sure why there's a background noise. Uh wow. So so Dan, if you can hear us, can you talk a little bit of yeah, there's just too much background noise right now. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should uh, turn off. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no. Okay, can you repeat the uh, uh, question? Yeah, so the, the question of uh, migration and also gender. Yes. Yeah, and migration, gender. Can you sort of speak about the experience of migration, gender, uh, especially you know the, the the worker that you are working with are, are primarily uh, female workers. How how do you how to sort of deal with this sort of gender and migration dimension of your work? Uh, gender and okay. Um. So. Uh, we are also active in a union, uh, so that uh, we have a, a gender mainstreaming in our union, and also uh, that's why we built the media, uh, community media conference, uh, specifically in a, a gender issue. Um, we realize uh, that. Uh, there are discrimination, discrimination, uh, gender discrimination in our society, and also uh, for women workers. And uh, we realize that uh, women workers are are the the strength of the of the workers movement and also people movement. And we have a program such as uh, women workers schools and also uh, small group discussion. Uh, in the workers' houses and also in the manufacturers uh, when they have a break time. And this is uh, to uh, make the workers' movement become more uh, concerned uh, about uh, women issue or gender equality, uh, including uh, LGBT also. And uh, we uh, campaign uh, that um, the patriarchal uh, system uh, in cap in the economic system right now, uh, capitalism, uh, rely the rely on uh, domestic work, domestic work uh, or reproductive work, uh, but uh, do not admit it as uh, work. So uh, we campaign that. Uh, so we support uh, that domestic work also work. That's why we support also domestic uh, workers uh, bill, and uh, we en we encourage uh, women uh, to be equal uh, at home and also in the working place. Um, it's a uh, um, when uh, we improve uh, or encourage women workers uh, to uh, in the leadership aspect. Uh, not only in the FBLP or our union, but also in other union. And we build and link each other of women worker activists 
uh, to work together about how to uh, improve the women uh, leadership in the union and also how uh, to gender to have gender mainstreaming uh, in the labor movement because uh, we realize that uh, now still the facts uh, when we have a meeting of labor movement there are only uh, one woman uh, some sometimes only one woman or only two women in the uh, in the meeting and it's uh, so uh, so we have a uh, homework uh, how to raise to raise the representative of a uh, woman in the labor movement so that the labor movement more have a gender perspective uh, that's how we deal uh, with the uh, uh, gender uh, gender issue uh, in a workers movement uh, internally in our union and also our media and uh, externally in uh, labor movement in general yeah thank you so much Dan. I think the noise may be coming from me. So um, despite that, um, Yang Kang, can you talk a little bit about, uh, so the, the, you know, there are several questions for you with regard to uh, domestic workers. Uh, in, uh, you know, you mentioned, you know, their struggle has been really, really impressive. And can you talk a little bit more about um, uh, the, the sort of uh, migrant labor struggle in Taiwan and also how it connect with, you know, other uh, struggles, other uni um, migrant worker struggle in the region? Okay, um, I think um, some of the thing I must mention in first hand is that um, work between migrant workers and workers in Taiwan are very segregated. So, like I said, migrant workers are the destination of our sourcing of um, the 3K jobs. And migrant workers and Taiwanese workers are very segregated. They don't really um, meet each other that often. So I think that's part of the reason why they can organize so su successfully, because they also have their own system of kinships. But um, uh, to address some of, the, some of the questions that are being raised around migrant workers. Um, yes, um, the most salient problem that migrant workers face in Taiwan is that the discrimination and also the unwillingness of Taiwanese workers to work with, to organize with them. Because they are, um, they are, um, let's say like this, the migrant workers and Taiwanese workers don't even have the same legal basis of working. So for migrant workers is service employment, uh, sorry, Employment Service Act, and for Taiwanese people, it's um, Labor Standard Act in most part. So they don't really have the same um, status of employment at all. So I think it's really hard for them to form alliances. And part of the reason is the legal basis. They face different forms of oppression. And also they don't, um, they are segregated. And also Taiwanese people are jerks. Taiwanese people, Taiwanese workers don't really um, feel like to form um, alliances with these people because of racism. There's racism in Taiwan, yay. Yeah, that's true. Um, but um, yeah, I think the point of using feminism as a base for solidarity is a potential way to go because some of the NGOs in Taiwan, for example, the Awakening Foundation, they actually um, organize their um, labor dimension. They have a lot of a lot of dimensions. They they organize their labor dimensions based on the gendered experience of people. So this also include migrant workers and Taiwanese workers. But um, once again, it's very segregated. So for example, um, migrant workers for females, they usually work in um, nursing and home care. But um, these works are rarely done by them. By, by, by Taiwanese people. And even they were done, they were being done by um, mid-aged or even um, like 40 or 50 years old female that don't really have a experience or the capacity to organize or to form alliances. So um, yeah, I, 
I think it might be a good start, but um, uh, I don't know. Um, I think we can try to do that, but I don't really think that the migrant, I think the migrant workers have done enough. And now we have to organize um, youth in Taiwan to try to look at their plight and their sufferings. And this same goes to the fishermen's um, union uh, that someone mentioned earlier, that um, for fishermen that we don't really see fishermen at all. I mean, if I walk on the streets, if like for general population of Taiwan, they don't really know the fish, they don't know where the fish they're eating comes, comes from, right? Even though Taiwan was one of the biggest fishery countries in the world, but they don't know that. So they don't really see the plight and the sufferings of those people. But I mean, um, for New Bloom, uh, we as a media project, I, I think we can work on that. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, if we recognize the oppression of capitalism is universal, then we also should recognize the solidarity that we come, that formed from the oppression should be universal. And I think with that belief, we can try to do everything I can, I guess. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, and as, I guess the same question for Promise uh, is the role of um, around 300,000 uh, domestic helpers in Hong Kong and their role both during the movement and also, you know, do you see uh, more uh, focus on, on their organizing going forward for the new union movement in, in, in Hong Kong? Yeah, um, I'll keep it kind of short because I think the law of dynamics are pretty similar to what, what Yang was saying about um, in Taiwan, right, in terms of this kind of traditional divide between the local workers and, uh, and a lot of the migrant workers, a lot of the kind of Southeast Asian migrant workers, right, from Philippines, from Indonesia, and things like that. Um, whereas, as kind of mentioned, I think actually the numbers is closer to 400,000 or more by this point, right? It's, it's a significant minority uh, of workers that kind of holds up a lot of like a majority of, of the domestic labor in Hong Kong. Um, you know, I was reading this kind of one, I think one important, um, you know, I'll just kind of say, you know, like, I, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of the migrant domestic workers, as far as I know, again, I, I've been a little out of touch with, with the most recent developments um, um, in the last couple of months. But as far as I know, throughout the movement, there's been a lot of fear, a lot of harassment, and there've been, you know, their, their kind of job conditions and their own kind of citizen, um, their own um, conditions of stay, right, is already extremely, extremely um, precarious and unprotected by the Hong Kong government. And, and I think with this movement, all that stuff has just been kind of exacerbated, right? So that's one thing to really keep in mind. Um, you know, I think there's a period of time when there's a lot of disinformation and, and, and people, you know, threatening, um, you know, from, from what I know, some of them, um, you know, there's some kind of anonymous messages circulating in some of the migrant workers group chats um, in the beginning of the year um, where, you know, they were threatened, right? Um, physically threatened, right? If they show up to a rally, right? And, and we don't know who these people are, if it's CCP disinformation or something. But so there's this kind of culture and atmosphere of fear on top of, right? Like they're already kind of um, very exploited condition. And, um, um, you know, for example, I, I think it was something like 80% of all migrant domestic workers owe or are in debt, right? So a lot of these exploitative recruitment agencies, right, um, that, that kind of govern and dictate their conditions of stay. So that's kind of one thing. And um, um, yeah, I think one important point I just kind of want to put in and keep in mind, right, is, is the fact that I think some scholar made this point that a lot of the participation or, or the kind of um, mass participation, right, that we see in this movement, in a way we can think of it as actually um, a, a very pivotal, pivotal part of it was enabled, right? by actually these migrant domestic workers who, especially the ones who didn't show up in the streets, right? Because, because they're the ones who are staying at home, taking care of, of, of the rest of the family or taking care of the house while their employers can go out to march, right? Because there is a significant kind of middle-class element in the protest, right? So I think that's, that's a really interesting way, I think, to look at the protest, right? And, and, and shaping the conditions of like, you know, who shows up in the protests and I think especially unpacking, right? This kind of, um, this kind of myth or this kind of, um, 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 ideal, right, of, of, of people who shows up on the front lines is considered the most dedicated to the movement, right? And I think the migrant domestic workers and their, situ their labor situation actually um, totally kind of reshapes, right, how we think about, um, um, you know, how labor functions, right, in the Hong Kong society, how labor determines um, visible and invisible labor, how that determines um, Hong Kong social movement building that people have um, um, not been there to kind of really explore yet. So, yeah, I'll, I'll just kind of leave it at that. I think a lot of, again, a lot of stuff I think Yan kind of covered, and I think Hong Kong is kind of 
a place where a lot of these contradictions, right, between the local and, and, and the migrant worker are just kind of um, rendered even more extreme, but yeah. Um, thank, thank you so much, Promise. Um, th there are a few, quite a few questions about um, both transnational organizing and solidarity, and also a question about nationalism um, um, and anti-colonialism. So can, can, can maybe we go back to Dan first uh, to talk about uh, both your experience with transnational organizing and solidarity, especially, you know, as Dan pointed out, uh, so much of the, what the migrant worker, uh, the female workers uh, uh, that she talks about are, are producing are for global brands. So, you know, maybe Dan, let's start with you. What do you see as a role of uh, transnational uh, organizing, campaigning and solidarity? And what do you think, what are the things that you think worked and, and what have not worked that well? Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, for many cases, uh, can you hear me? My voice is clear. <laughs> yeah. Um, for many cases, uh, we have uh, solidarity uh, linked with a clean cloth campaign, uh, for example. Um, when we have a case that the employer uh, neglect the workers or move to an, or close the manufacturer but do not uh, pay uh, any compensation for workers, uh, we publish and they publish uh, and contact the brands uh, about the situation. And uh, finally, yes, uh, in any cases, uh, the brand uh, then pay uh, the compensation uh, but uh, it always happened so the case uh, always happened uh, repeated uh, so many times uh, in years so it's like uh, okay one case uh, finished then uh, ha it happened again in another case um, maybe we should uh, have a new strategy how uh, no violence uh, anymore uh, by the brands and the manufacturers and how the brands have a, a commitment uh, to uh, to have no violence against uh, again for for the workers uh, for example uh, can it be in the international uh, trial for the brand who violate against the workers uh, can it be possible because uh, uh, if uh, it always happen then they, then we need more uh, solidarity uh, stronger solidarity uh, to to handle uh, the the case so that no repeat anymore uh, so it never happen again Mm, I think uh, the workers itself also need to be more uh, close to another uh, issue, for example, environmental issue, uh, also ecological issue, uh, and a gender issue, so that uh, in more it will be more intersectional, and it's like a strengthen the solidarity uh, for from many groups uh, that uh, we have uh, same problem uh, finally mm -hmm. and connect with each other uh, like this uh, i think it's also important and and moving on to 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 yang kang and uh, obviously you know and you touch a little bit about this as well the sort of geopolitical uh, implications are you going to call that really call that caught up in, in geopolitics. So there are, you know, a couple of questions specifically for you. One is, uh, how has the Taiwanese labor left responded to the attacks that accuse them of making the country weaker against China? And I guess just what are the situation for, for labor movement, right? Uh, on the one hand, uh, you have uh, challenges domestically, but also the geopolitical aspect. How do you navigate that uh, for, for labor left uh, in Taiwan? Okay. Um, so once again, I'm not I'm not really an organizer, so I can really uh, speak from a high ground perspective. <laughs> but um, the thing I want to mention is that I don't care. I mean, some of them are close to China. Some of the most vocal supporters and organizers are close to China, and well, actually, pro an pro an annexation, pro annexation, pro annexation. Yeah, they're pretty close to China, but I don't care. 
I mean, in the chat, someone mentioned that maybe China funded BLM. I don't care. BLM was still very valid, and labor movement are still very valid. I mean, there is some risk that China is like putting their hand in their own, our own business. But I mean, if DPP really cared so much about China, then they should done things right. So they wouldn't have the chance to let China's hands just seep into our own our own stuff, right? I mean, um, yeah, I mean, um, it's really hard to communicate to other people on this issue. But I mean, um, just because some people men, um, brought up your issue is someone you don't like, you don't, you cannot have this like a genetic fallacy to that. But um, I think um, the position of labor movement in Taiwan that was not being welcomed by Taiwanese general public and also not welcomed by the government have a advantage that um, Taiwanese labor movement don't really look outside. I mean, not just for migrant workers, but for example, when the JASIC strikes in China was happening, um, Taiwanese labor left doesn't really say much about that. And I think if you are really leftist and you are not just pro-China state cooperatist leftists, if that's still considered to be leftist. If you're not that, and you're really a leftist, you have those ideals, then, I mean, I think Taiwanese and um, labor left in this pretty awkward position, in this um, liminal space, they actually have more um, flexibility to do that, to form, to just broadly and just um, briefly form on seemingly possible alliances with others. I mean, I mean, maybe from doing that, they're weakening the authority and the legitimacy of the Chinese state even better than the DDP government is doing. Yeah, so, I mean, if you ask me, um, are the labor left in, sorry, in Taiwan close to China, then, then the answer is I don't care. Yeah, just fix your damn issues and, and then we'll talk, I guess. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Uh, I promise, and the same question, same set of questions for you, right? What, what is the role of transnational solidarity in, in the Hong Kong movement? Uh, and you already touched a little bit about that, but also the issue of nationalism. Uh, how, how do you see, uh, and, and, and anti colonialism, how do you see Hong Kong's place in that, and the Hong Kong's movement? Um, uh, the, uh, with, regard to, with regard to those things. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I touched uh, a little bit on transnational solidarity in my talk. So and I'll, I'll just kind of emphasize this point, right? Um, that transnational solidarity must be embedded in local struggles, right? It's about connecting these different local struggles rather than doing a lot to invent things anew. And about the significance, right, of transnational solidarity. I think one thing that's important, or at least one framing, I think, um, um, I'm hoping to promote, right, and hoping to amplify, I think the left should be able to um, mobilize around, right, is the fact that, um, you know, Hong Kongers have this thing called, right, like the international line, right, like the Gaozai scene, right, that, that has guided, right, right, international solidarity over the past year and even before that, right, it's, it's a lot of lobbying U.S. senators for bills or something, right, it's a lot of, uh, I don't know, photo ops, right, with Joshua Wong or Nathan Law, whatever, you know, I, I think, I think, in increasingly there's been kind of consensus right of what international solidarity looks like right and it's these very specific um you know closed door meetings or 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 kind of you know very liberal right right methods in terms of appealing to all these senators without in my in my read um you know actually a lot doing a lot of times addressing um the core of the problem in hong kong and being actually able to support what's going on and hit at the root of the problems and oppression in hong kong so i think thinking of something like union solidarity worker solidarity right as a concrete substitute, right? Um, or not substitute, or maybe as an alternative, right? A very concrete alternative that can actually talk about the root of the oppression, right? Of state capitalist violence, right? The two things can't be delinked, right? Um, it's not just CCP authoritarianism in a, in, a, in a kind of very abstract sense. It's also not just kind of a, a pure uh, capitalism that you, where, where you can't consider the role of nationalism, Chinese nationalism and the like, right? It, it's those two things together, right? And how can workers and union solidarity offer a kind of alter, alternative, right? To, to, um, to the kind of uh, traditional uh, interna international line, right? Which has, which has really only um, resulted in, right? American sanctions, which is a terrible kind of history, right? Especially in a lot of places that has kind of um, seen American influence, right? 
um, or something purely defensive, right? Uh, in terms of kind of refugee status and access and things like that, right? How can Union Solidarity provide a kind of more positive platform towards that? Um, you know, things I'm thinking of are like coordinated actions or something as simple or basic as just political exchange or education, right? I think is super important. I want to point to a kind of interesting moment, I think, in the, I'm going back to the medical workers um, webinar thing I was talking about, right? Um, you know, there's this moment, I think this is after the, the, the webinar, or even during the webinar, when when the American um, um, rank and file workers were, were kind of, you know, promoting or talking about some books, right, that helped them in, in very concrete organizing, right? And th these are stuff that I think if you're in kind of labor organizing circles in the left in the U.S., you're, you're familiar with, right? Jay McAlevey, right? Or, or, or Kim Moody or Secrets of a Successful Organizer from Labor Notes and things like that. And then the Hong Kong organizers are like, whoa, these sound very interesting, right? Like, like give, me, give me the names of these, we're gonna search it up and stuff, right? And at the same time, right, on the US side, it's like, you know, they were kind of blown away, right? To hear about the fact that HAEA in Hong Kong has been able to like recruit, like to start a union from scratch and recruit that many members within a span of like a month or two or something or a couple of months, right? And so like this, this kind of element of surprise, right? This element of like, wait, how, how did you guys do this thing, right? I think even that itself, right, is something that, that um, could keep guiding our praxis, right? Because these are the moments that actually where not just solidarity, but very pragmatic ways in which these movements can transform itself, right? Can build its own capacity um, um, kind of arise, right? So I think, um, um, you know, what, I'll, I'll kind of end on this note, right? I think the, the, the movement in the past year in Hong Kong has been characterized by a lot of, um, you know, a lot of spectacle, right? A lot of fast and quick solutions, right? US sanctions in China, whatever, right? A lot of these kind of very choppy, fast things. But in reality, do those things really actually help what's going on on the ground, right? I think that's one thing that we need to kind of uh, ask right now that we're in this kind of uh, very scary and, 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 and this, whatever, this is the scary state, right? Like in, in the aftermath of national security laws, as we're also reevaluating our strategy to movement, right? And I think this kind of, you know, abstract thing we call transnational solidarity, especially from the position of the left, from the position of workers-led movements, right? is slower it's it's going to be it's not going to be all the spectacles it's not sanctioned it's not something flashy that you could put on the media but you know from my understanding i, I think a, a lot of us share this how can this angle right actually be a um um a way to actually sustain um an effective praxis right that can actually not only build the movement in hong kong but you know other places that's under you know ccp state capitalist oppression through its corporations um in collusion with u.s corporations british corporations and things like that so it's sustainable it's slow right and how can we make that attractive and how can we make that look and actually seem and, and, and work for people um in hong kong um and give that kind of practical element i think is the question that um trade unionists and activists kind of need to urgently grapple with today because i think the possibilities are there right but but I think rhetoric is important, organizing is important, right? Um, and, and how you actually put things in a way that's attractive to people, um, the audience and the people you organize with is key. Thanks, Promise. And I think that this really brings back, uh, brings us back to the question of, of the role of uh, all the different media projects that we are all engaged in and how, uh, how, how we can sort of support uh, this movement. So uh, a sort of question that I want to pose is, Basically, how, how media projects like ours uh, in different positions, you know, some are very much rooted in the struggle, others are in the diaspora. How, how, do, we, how do we grow and develop our media practices so that we can actually intervene and support uh, both discursively, but also uh, helping to really uh, build, uh, you know, strong ties and, and solidarity with uh, transnational networks. Uh, so I'm going back to Dan. You know, I, I'm actually really, really interested to hear a bit more about how you came to join this radio project. And I also, you know, I think we're all really astonished to hear, you know, the range of things you're, you, you, you and, and your colleagues are doing, you know, the radio, uh, community radio, but also <clears throat> website and films and, and, and articles, et cetera. How, how are you able to do all this? And, and how, how, where do you see uh, that the project uh, is going to develop? Okay, uh, so let me start uh, for the documentary film. <laughs> uh, we only uh, still one film, yeah, one documentary film. Uh, we have a uh, corporate uh, work together with the uh, filmmakers. 
on other filmmakers and um, they uh, have a workshop uh, for us so we have five uh, women workers uh, to be trained uh, in the work in the workshop as a camera person and also uh, how to be a director how to build a storyline and at the same time uh, we have a, a program to the issue of sexual harassment in working in working place and we have uh, some strikes against sexual harassment in the manufacture so uh, at the time uh, we uh, conclude that it's important to document uh, to record uh, to document our activities and uh, so that the audience uh, on the public uh, know uh, what uh, really happened uh, in uh, with the uh, women workers? Uh, why women workers also uh, join the national strike? Uh, why we always have a demonstration, and so that the people know, uh, the public know. Oh, uh, this is uh, what happened with the uh, women workers. And and the workshop is started in 20, 2013. Uh, and in 2016, we start uh, to have uh, our first project about sexual harassment in working place. And of course, it's it's really hard for me and for our our friends uh, because uh, we should uh, join in the. At the same time, we we have uh, we are filmmakers, and at the same time, we are the part of the community, and so we need. Uh, the the top people uh, to to analyze uh, that all the uh, the storyline need to be like this uh, to be more objective because we are the part of the community and we document uh, our own activities and so we have to concentrate uh, with two uh, two aspects the advocacy itself and also uh, how to make uh, the film. So we have uh, regularly uh, discussed about the process of the film, about the storyline, about the materials, about the uh, visual. Uh, so we wish we always uh, monitoring uh, about this. So we we did uh, two uh, two things at the same time. So, and the the challenge is. Uh, uh, it's very hard, of course, and we should listen, uh, listen the the cases. Uh, we have to uh, encourage the victim to speak up, and sometimes it's, uh, it's really hard. Uh, sometimes it's also trigger, uh, trigger because we also the we also the survivors and we also know the victim, and we listen the victim and encourage the victim to speak up, and we do comment uh, all of this in the film. So it's like, uh, okay, uh, we do it in collectively. Uh, we should uh, finish the, the film. And this is our first time, uh, our first film. So just finish it. And if we need to time to break, just uh, break. If we need to have a counseling and have a counseling with, uh, with some uh, NGO who focus on counseling uh, in sexual harassment issue. And finally, uh, it take uh, one year yeah, uh, to produce the documentary film. And until now, uh, the the subject in the film uh, refused to refused to watch uh, the film uh, in public. So we have a, a roadshow, film roadshow, and she refused. Oh, it's okay. It's the it's a, our kind of support uh, for her uh, to protect herself, and we really realize about it. And the important thing is, a uh, film is the uh, significant uh, tool or media to transfer the message and to change the mindset, the patriarchal mindset of the society that sexual harassment is exist uh, and we should admit it and we should talk about it and we should change the mindset so that the victim will not blame anymore as the victim and, and start to discuss uh, that is important and this is also the part of to legalize uh, the bill of uh, sexual violence, anti-sexual violence bill. Okay, that's uh, the film. And now we still start to to learn, uh, start to produce second 
uh, documentary and it's really hard because uh, we say that it should be better than the first documentary. So it's like, uh, okay, uh, we should uh, improve uh, our skills. Uh, it's not easy, uh, but uh, we still uh, keep trying. Thank you so much, Dan. And I think I think we really all really appreciate the work you and your colleagues are doing, and it's just it's just astonishing. Um, uh, Kang, I kind of want to go to you next about um, the role of media. Um, and you know, I, I I've noticed over the years that New Bloom really published a, a, a you know a tremendous amount of uh, coverage on, on labor struggles, not just in Taiwan, but uh, in, in Asia more generally. So how do you see the role of a media uh, outlet like uh, New Bloom in, in, you know, in terms of intervening uh, in the labor struggles in Taiwan and, and more broadly? Um, first of all, I, I have to say I'm relatively new to New Bloom actually. So um, I joined New Bloom last year, I believe, um, to host their reading groups. So I don't really write for New Bloom per se, but um, I think I think maybe Brian is still here. Maybe he can say something. But um, for me, I think um, the role of media, the, the role of journalism really is to bring the reality to people's faces. And I think uh, a lot of people in Taiwan or a lot of people everywhere, they are, they are rather um, ignorant. They're ignorant to the reality or they are not willing to face reality. And I think um, in the case of labor movement and labor organizing in Taiwan, that's both. So people are not willing to see that they are being oppressed because that's not a fun feeling. And if you feel that you are being oppressed and have to do something about it, so they um, just draw back to this more of a passive state. And um, also people don't, don't like to do that, don't, don't like to be reminded that, that, well, you have to do something. So I think maybe journalism is to, the role of journalism is try to convey this message in a more gentle and more um, to create this narrative that you are not, you are in this condition, but you are not in this alone. That we can tell you that all these people are coming together to do something together. And I think that's something very powerful. And I think, um, maybe that's the role of the media. For example, like we said earlier, that um, the struggles of migrant workers is one of the most salient, but um, only when they have riots, then they'll be on the mainstream media. But when they have like press conferences or when they have these um, small protests, this will not be seen by the general public. And I think um, either the mainstream media don't want to do that or they're not, um, they're not in, they don't want to do that. And Taiwanese people don't want to watch that. And I think um, maybe for New Bloom and more indie um, media, I think um, the thing we can do is to try to tell the story that being not being told by others. And I think that can carry some meaning. Yeah, I guess that's all. Thanks and, and the promise. Uh, how do you see, you know, Lao San, uh, going forward to support, you know, in terms of supporting uh, the Hong Kong movement, but also, as you mentioned, you know, to uh, really centering uh, worker stories, uh, worker struggle, uh, but uh, as well as sort of explicitly, you know, decolonial and uh, anti-capitalist perspective. How do you see the role of Lao San in, 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 in promoting uh, those ideas and, and perspectives? Right, yeah, uh, I'll keep it as short as possible because I know we're running out of time. But um, actually, before I answer that, I actually want to just give a quick shout out actually to um, the role of independent media on the ground itself in Hong Kong, right? I think that's a, a hugely neglected factor in, in this whole movement, um, especially how we read it from the outside, right? Because honestly, I think, I don't know if it's an exaggeration, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say actually, like some of the most rigorous political analysis and, and, and vibrant political debates, right, about the Hong Kong movement um, exists in these kind of zine forms, right, that only exists like li quite literally on the ground or in these kind of online forums and things like that. Um, and how culture and publication can be such an important site of struggle. Um, and, and especially the unions, I think, you know, and this is another example, I think some of the new unions actually just created its own zine um, called like, like 
union's heartbeat or something. And right, so it's like just to summon it as, a, as like a zine, right? And, and this is actually where you get like the really front lines, the really raw, like the really real updates of what's going on and what these new formations are thinking. So I highly recommend just kind of uh, encouraging folks to think more and, and, and do the hard work of actually, you know, jumping on the ground to see what, what these materials are like. A lot of these are untranslated, but I think this is actually, the, the, these, these sites actually reveal a lot of the complexity of this movement that is kind of uncaptured, right? By Western media and, 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 and by Chinese media, et cetera. As for Lao San's role, I think this is something that a boat has alluded to, I think, um, in, in our panel two days ago, right? The tension and ambiguity, right, of Lao San in the, in the center, right? Are we a media outlet or are we an organizing group, right? I think that ambiguity precisely allows us to do the sort of organizing work that uh, some, of the, some of which I've begun to kind of detail in my presentation, right? How to exploit that kind of ambiguity between, you know, uh, words, discourse, or intervening in that front, but also trying to shift ideas on the ground, right, with 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 real life people, um, to advance new forms of international solidarity and and new forms of how we trouble, right, the distinction between diaspora activism and local activism, right? Because Los Angeles itself is both local and diaspora, right? And and how can we kind of make use of this kind of unique space of people um, to advance ideas? Um, you know, one thing that we've done is like host reading groups, right? Um, whether it's online or, or, or physically in person, right? In New York or other places, um, you know, of course with the pandemic and stuff, things have uh, granted to halt, but then we're trying to restart things and things like that. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, and also I think, you know, some of our friends and allies have held spaces, right? To connect mainland students and Hong Kong students to actually just talk about the movement, talk about their feelings, which has been such a, you know, it's such a difficult thing to do in Hong Kong itself, right? Because of all the tensions and all the ongoing struggles. I think in the diaspora, there's actually that breathing space, right? Where we can advance a lot of these kind of, um, have a lot of these important dialogues and, and, and feelings and things like that. And I think the important thing for people to kind of always think about is you never know the influence you have, right? In diaspora, especially in this kind of culture and day and age of migration of how the people you affect and touch, right? And you reach and radicalize or organize, whatever, right? And, and their effects and what their effects would be when, you know, some of them actually end up being organizers or something back in their home countries in China or Hong Kong, however dangerous it is right now. So I think the influence um, might not be very apparent, but I think that diaspora work is very important. And, and something like a transnational independent outlet um, has the capacity to advance that type of space um, um, and to promote that type of discourse. So, I mean, so yeah, there's a lot of, um, you know, last thing I'll end on too, you know, right, like there's a lot of, uh, a lot of radical movement, a lot of radical energies, right, and in, in, in movements in Hong Kong, China, you know, came from the influence, that right? came from the, the discourse and, and the exchange, right, between these places and the outside world, so to speak, right? I mean, from, you know, you know, just to go back really far, right, like how Marx, right, entered into Chinese political discourse, right, and how, you know, actually a lot of those people who first promoted these ideas were exchange students, right? They're international students in the beginning of the last century, right? And similarly in Hong Kong, right, of the 70s generation, right, which is really the first kind of radical Hong Kong centered um, um, left generation, right? Pushing back against British imperialism, right? A lot of these people are actually, you know, they were critically engaging with the new left, right? That's going on around them in the United States and Paris and things like that, right? Criti not just imitating, right? But critically engaging with those ideas. Um, you know, some people having the experience to travel to the ideas to, to connect with other activists there. And those ideas I mean, up having to shape the movement back home. So I think a similar type of effort, a similar type of attitude, right? Towards what's going on the last couple of years, um, is yeah, would be effective, and I think um, that's kind of uh, a value of transnational solidarity. Thank you so much. I, I think this is such a rich discussion, and there's so much more uh, we can discuss. Uh, I, I I would really highly encourage people to you know obviously check out the website uh, of of Lausa, of New Bloom and New Narrative, but uh, also DM's uh, Radio Community Project. Um, I think their links are already shared in the chat. Uh, and also just get in touch with uh, those organizations and media uh, outlets, uh, you know, either to make a donation or to contribute your writing articles or just to become a volunteer for, for their, you know, for translation or, or other things. Uh, I, think, I think, you know, as we are, you know, this, this event is very much, you know, a time to really build those uh, connections among different labor uh, struggles, but also different uh, media practices uh, that that are anti-capitalist uh, and colonial. Uh, so thank you again to all the uh, to the three speakers, Promise, uh, Kang, and and Dan, and also the three uh, organize, organizing organizations, uh, New Narrative, 
uh, New Bloom and Lao San. And thank you, you all, for, for staying for more than an hour and a half uh, on this event. And uh, have a good evening or a good morning. Thank you for joining us.